Hello, I'm Jason Solomons and welcome to Seen Any Good Films Lately. After the embarrassment of cinematic riches that was the London Film Festival, the podcast turns to the small screen for this week's guest. Just the mastery of taking that subject matter and that world and and bringing a a clown-like, child-like innocence and play is just such a masterpiece. That's Sarah Soleimani, whose TV drama Ridley Road reaches its tingling climax on BBC One this weekend. Sarah, who's the star of Bridget Jones's Baby, Bad Education on telly and in the movie, and How to Build a Girl, takes us through the writing and making of the excellent Ridley Road, reclaiming narratives and the films that make her laugh, cry, fall in love and dance. Sarah Soleimani is my guest after I tell you if I've seen any good films lately. I wish I had, particularly the closing film of the London Film Festival, which was The Tragedy of Macbeth. By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. This is by Joel Cohen, working without his brother Ethan for the first time, but, you know, with Shakespeare as writing companion instead. I don't know why, but I'd assumed there was something in this that was a bit meta, you know, something about actors putting on a production of Macbeth or a wry take on it, but no, it's a pretty straight, black and white, heavily stylized, theatrically filmed adaptation of the play. Although significantly butchering the text until I wasn't really sure what was going on or why things were happening. Quite strange, really. Denzel Washington is Macbeth, and usually I'd pay to hear Denzel read out the instruction manual on a IKEA shelving unit. But his delivery here is flat. And Francis McDormand, as Lady Macbeth, is all wrong too. There's just no sense of connection between them. And therefore there's no sense of the ineluctable tragedy or hubris. I didn't like the costumes. I didn't like the editing. If my kids were doing this for GCSE, I wouldn't show them the Joel Cohen version. Even at a fairly brisk 90 minutes, it felt a lot longer. And I think they were a bit scared of the best bits. You know, the greatest hits. The is this a dagger I see before me? And the tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow creeps with this petty pace. It just didn't kind of go for it. Only the witches, who were all played by... The extraordinary Catherine Hunter brought something startling to it. And there's, there's just not enough of them or her in the movie. So, as I like to concentrate on seeing good films lately, what have I seen? It's a good play about a great film. It's called The Shark is Broken, and it's a perfectly formed and performed behind-the-scenes sort of play written by and starring Ian Shaw, who's the actual son of Robert Shaw, who played salty sea dog Quint in the film and who gets eaten by the shark. Not in this play though, he doesn't get eaten because this is about the real life or larger than life Robert Shaw and his co-stars Richard Dreyfuss and Roy Scheider hanging about, drinking and fighting on the boat set while waiting for the damn shark to work so they can get done with filming and get on with the rest of their careers. Shaw himself is remarkable here, partly because he looks just like his dad did as Quint and frankly nobody could ever look like that surely but the play is just three actors talking and it's got little details about some of the most memorable scenes in modern Hollywood history such as how Scheider improvised the you're gonna need a bigger boat line and how Close Encounters was forming next in Spielberg's mind and how they nicknamed the shark Bruce all of that is really fascinating and fun And as Scheider and Dreyfus, Dimitri Goritzas and Liam Murray-Scott come up with nicely contrasting energies. Scheider is all like healthy and reasoned and calm. And Dreyfus is a live wire, self-obsessed mess of drugs and paranoia. It's very enjoyable, uh, co-written by Ian Shaw and Joseph Nixon. And made me wonder why we love all these mythical weavings off camera and behind camera. Anyway... If you like Jaws, if you hate sharks, if you like actors and stories about actors and movies, The Shark is Broken is at the Ambassador's Theatre, which is a lovely little venue next door, The Mousetrap. And you must read the programme notes. They're really fascinating and illuminating. And yes, you do get a few of those John Williams bass notes just to warn you what's coming.
And in more film-related but not actual film news, I saw the exhibition of The French Dispatch, the new Wes Anderson movie. And I have to say, I like the exhibition a lot more than I like the movie because the design and details were the best thing about the film and they're all there to admire at 180 The Strand in this exhibition. Plus, you can have coffee and croissants at the Sonblag Café. So on display alongside the costumes and artefacts and props and backdrops are the actual paintings made in the film by Benicio del Toro's character, Rosenthaler. Huge canvases painted by real artist Sandro Kopp. So I spoke to Sandro to find out more about working under Wes Anderson's very particular direction and what this part of the movie might build up to actually mean. Basically, we knew that we wanted them to look like paintings. We knew that we wanted them to look. We knew the sizes. We knew the subjects. It was going to be highly abstracted nudes in those specific sizes. The small one was going to be dominantly black and flesh and the large ones were going to dominantly be orange and flesh. Everything else we didn't know. So I got there with a very clearly worked out set of ideas of what I was going to do, uh, which were immediately where she said, no, 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 we're going to test. We're going to work this out. And he was completely right. So he said, first of all, paint a smallish square panel with flesh. Figure out how are you going to render flesh? Mm. And I said, yeah, no, 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 we have to worry about the overall composition. And I had all these designs and these ideas. And said, no, 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 just do a panel of how you're going to paint flesh. So in the end, I did that. And then he said, great, now do another one. This time, use a wider variety of marks. Put more detail into it. OK, next day, now, that was great. Now do another one. This time, only use geometric shapes. Don't use any kind of uh, organic lines. When more, you said you got um, there, where, where did you go? Did you? Angoulême. You went to, so you I lived, went to set? I lived, of course, yes, yes. I was there um, uh, in Angoulême for three months painting, and we had this beautiful derelict old felt factory where all the sets were built, and I had a sort of curtained off area. It was incredibly cold. And we had these big plastic curtains. It was like a magical one. It was the only warm space. So people loved to come and visit me in, in the set because I had like five cannon heaters roaring at the same time to get the paintings dry. And yeah, three months to do these pictures. So you were very much part of the, the set and the world rather than doing it in isolation and doing it, you know, because they, he, he could shoot them differently. You were very much, they were going to be part of this. Absolutely. You know. Yes, I was there and in fact, living in the hotel with everybody. And um, I was, you know, the moment Tony Rivellori arrived, who plays young Rosenthaler, we like got a model and started doing live painting together. And then I started to do the portraits of him for the self-portrait. And then I hand doubled him. So when you see Tony painting in the film, that's my hand poking through a hole in the back of his sleeve and me sitting out of the way of the camera behind him doing the thing. And then when Benicio arrived, which was much later, so for me, in a way, my kind of main attachment to Rosenthaler was via Tony much more than Benicio, because Benicio arrived when I was almost finished with the paintings. Um, and then when we actually shot the sequence in the hobby room with the art opening and the big reveal of the paintings and all of that, I was I had a little cameo as one of the Splatter School artists. So I was actually able to be there all the time while we were shooting. Oh, Sandra, I can't believe I didn't spot you. Yeah with a central parting. I'm in the first still of the film, bro. Um, <laughs> the French Dispatch exhibition is on at 180 The Strand till November the 14th. See the film first is my advice. But if not, uh, it's a lovely walk through an exhibition and you can hear that uh, on my Totally Wired radio show on the Totally Wired radio website. Just go to the Jason Solomon show and catch it up there. <laughs> So now to the telly for the finale of Ridley Road. I'm totally hooked on how it will turn out for Vivian Epstein, who's gone undercover with those hooligan racists led by Rory Kinnear's Colin Jordan. What a story it's been so far, woven around the edges of a troubling true-life tale about how the fascists marched in London streets, attacking synagogues and brandishing swash stickers in 19... 19- 
blimmin' 62. When I spoke to Sarah Soleimani, who wrote this, and isn't in it, but Tracy Ann Oberman is, and Eddie Marsden is, and Will Keane is, and the Samantha Spiro is, and the newcomer Aggie O'Casey, who we heard from uh, a few episodes ago, I confess to Sarah that I didn't know this story at all, neither of Colin Jordan and his party of fascists, nor of the Jewish activists who set up the 62 group in the East End to combat them. No one knew. No one, I mean, apart from the people who were involved and, and their families and their immediate circle, no one knew. Even, you know, my dad who grew up around that area didn't know really the extent of how organised the far right were and how targeted it was. And this underground group of Jewish men and women who called themselves the 62 Committee that became known as the 62 Group, who bandied together to fight literally fight muscle to muscle fascists off the streets of London and push them to the fringes of British politics. Why didn't I know this story, Sarah? It's a very good question. And it's one that is kind of revealing itself. The answer is revealing itself as we take this out um, and seeing the responses to it. I think it's an uncomfortable slice of our history that that we like to think, you know, Hitler and the, the, the Nazis over there in Germany, those were the bad guys and we were the good guys. And it sort of died when you know, with Hitler in the bunker. But actually our relationship with that, this kind of thinking is much closer than we like to think. Um, but also our history of, of fighting it and our, our history of a, a, an anti-fascist movement is, is, is very powerful and, and inspiring that we have between Jew- the Jewish community and, and other minority groups. So it feels particularly meaningful that we have got this story across the line and it wasn't an easy journey. You know, for all the Jewish experience that is reflected on screen, it's it's New Yorky, it's whatever, it's not it's not UK. And this one felt to me, in fact, when I heard that this was coming up, I thought, Biddy Road, I thought, well, perhaps this is a, a, a Cable Street thing. And I was absolutely shocked to actually start thinking, oh my God, it's the 60s. There are swastikas right. in Trafalgar Square in the 60s. Yeah. How could this happen? Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's so alarming. And that they could get a permit and that they had police protection and that it was the anti-fascists that were often arrested that protested against them. I think one thing I did want to present in this show, and I think it's living outside, I'm based in Los Angeles um, now, and living in America and um, certainly experiencing Judaism through that, you know, in, in that space is just totally different. And realizing the experience of the British Jew, there's only 269,000 of us in this country, the experience of a British Jew cannot be compared Mm. to the experience of the Jew in America or the experience of the Jew in Israel. It's its own experience with its own history, its own pain. And I think when we have, when that comes into the public debate and the public discourse, we talk very globally about uh, the Middle East and the Jewish experience within that, but we don't talk nationally or regionally about what it feels like. And and even just conversations I've had with people who have the myth of like the Hasidic communities being wealthy because of their smart dress and not understanding that there is very little material wealth in those communities because their dedication to Talmud or child rearing and just small little myths that have been broken just from the conversation have been. I'm thinking it says, it says, um, you know, if you look, if you Wikipedia yourself, don't bother doing it too much but you're it says activist Sarah Solomon it says I think it's an actress activist it's, it's kind of kind of quite high up there um and it's certainly for writing this I think it's a it's, it's a brilliant form of activism I I think and, you know all the communities want to get involved in watching this I think it's just going to be a fabulous story about British history you must have been very excited I don't know if it was you that found all this archive footage I was amazed <clears throat> by it yeah, no, that was the the team at Red, um, uh, who 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 founded and and made. So you, it in work. the screenplay, you didn't know it was there. Um, I knew Pathé. I I I actually I put in the screenplay. I think for the the rallies, because yeah. I found them on like the Pathé archives, which you can access on YouTube. I I did want to to see if there was a way of making it work, but the production team really ran with it, and we have a lot of a lot of the sort of contextualizing the story came out of the housing situation. So these slum houses were being demolished, the high rises were going up. And so I wanted in Nettie, who's the landlady that Vivian stays with, I wanted her to be really, she was in between two spaces. So there was constantly the noise of construction and just this invasive sense of one era being kind of 
demolished and another era coming through and what psychologically that would do. And so when a community leader comes on and presents views that veer to the far right, you'd never know which way she's she's going to go. And so the, so the footage is, um, yeah, it's really useful in, in, in showing you just what it felt like in the landscape at the time. Did you watch any films to research for it? I did. My number one favourite film of all time, which probably informs who I am as an artist, as a creator, is Life is Beautiful. Oh. The, and the, I mean, the, I'm even getting emotional just thinking about the it The Roberta now. Benigni film. Yeah. Mm. Just the mastery of taking that, taking that subject matter and that world and, and, and bringing a, a clown-like, child-like innocence and play is just such a masterpiece and kind of that line between comedy and tragedy, which is I, I think I'm treading in my work and never just bashing you around the head with trauma because that's not truthful. We do have these moments of humour in the bleakest of times, and but you have to earn those. And, and actually with Ridley Road, even though they're sort of doing a lot of press about the themes and the weight, there's so many light moments. Yeah. Would you say that, that Life is Beautiful is a film that changed your life? Yeah, I think it did. Because if you think about the Jewish experience of, of processing a history of persecution or threat or the worst thing that could possibly happen, you know, it's in, in the, the joke that every High Holy Day is they tried to kill us, they didn't, let's eat. Yeah. So to then bring into the culture something that doesn't undermine or diminish or glorify the world like it's totally true to history mm. but then finds that like I said I mean it finds that play and joy in it uh that I think that did change my life ma deve proprio andare a casa è gelato già è gelato al cioccolato prendiamolo subito no ora no e quando eh, non lo so eh, facciamo decidere al cielo anche questo no per carità lasci stare la madonna non la disturbi per un gelato al cioccolato eh, eh, eh no, è troppo importante, non sappiamo decidere quando prenderlo questo gelato, glielo devo chiedere, via. Maria, manda qualcuno a dirci fra quanto tempo dobbiamo prendere questo gelato al cioccolato. Fra sette minuti. The, the other film that, I, that really did inspire me for this was Conspiracy with Kenneth Branagh. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah which is men sitting around a table talking about you know the final solution mm. and it's so well done it's so underrated actually i think it's very it? under i mean very very rarely quoted very under you know under yeah. in kenneth's canon you know because it's it, it bizarrely takes the heat out and and it goes into the admin of dealing with people yeah. which we have now with the refugee crisis sure. it's like it's but admin you also is in is in your the way that the you know, that the far right are organising, you know, and they, it, it is an admin job, you know, he's got a desk. Yes. Yeah, very interesting. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's 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 a conversation and then you just have very moments of people in that room going, but we're talking about human beings, yeah. well, where would they go and how would they be removed? And it's, it's and that to me, I think is, is, is fascinating and alarming on, on how you can dehumanise people yeah. in that way. And, and you have both, you know, immigration and refugee problems, the humanity is sometimes removed, but, but sometimes the nature of running a country means you, your legislation can't always be, you know, have be loaded, be guided by empathy. So it's about how, you know, the, 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 the boundaries we put, put on ourselves with that. And, and that film just, it's all, it's just men talking around a table. Yeah. And well, it's the most gripping film I've ever seen. Yeah. Settled, we are moving along. Now we are presented with a difficult problem. My instinct is to be Alexandrian and solve a difficult tangle with a sharp, clean stroke this afternoon. All our actions must be predicated on law. Everything we have done flows from the Nuremberg Laws, which Dr. Stuckert brought forth to the Reichstag in 1935. And now we have to examine those, the blood and honor laws in regard to the problems of mixed marriages and persons of mixed blood. Uh, not only who is a Jew, but how in each defined circumstance the Jew is expunged from society, the government, the economy, through ordinances. A tapestry, if you'll uh, permit some pride. The exemptions written into the law allow too many Jews to remain among us. We address that problem by examining each category and every exemption. 
was the first film you saw in the cinema? Do you know what? I texted my dad that because I saw that you had asked it and I couldn't remember. So I texted him and he said, it was Disney Sleeping Beauty. I remember it so well. We were going up to the circle seats, cheapskate, <laughs> um, and I was carefully watching your face as you reached the top of the stairs and saw a massive screen for the first time showing glorious colour film and your mouth dropped open and eyes widened in wonder and excitement. It was fantastic. That is gorgeous. Do you know where it might have been? He didn't say, but I reckon it might have been Muswell Hill Odeon mm. because that's that where makes, I... Yeah, but it makes sense. That's got the circle. It's got the, the height. Mm. Oh, yeah. 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 And he's a, he's an extraordinary film buff, my dad. He, he, he collects... He's got this ridiculous DVD collection. I mean, it's like five or 6,000 films. So did and you have has... film posters in your house? Did you have a film poster when you were a teenager? I did. I had film posters. Or maybe Pulp Fiction. Ah. You know, that's, that was like a staple of the 90s, I think, is that we, you had your Pulp Fiction poster. And Absolutely. that was just like, whoa, <laughs> this was cinema. That, um, yeah, what iconic. It's an iconic image, isn't it? And it's an iconic poster. So, yes, I think everyone did have that one. Do you have yes. one now? I don't really have much stuff on the about the industry in my house because I just need escape. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this dominates my life in so many ways. But I do have one photo. The only photograph I have of uh, that's related to my career or, or, or about the film TV in general is a photograph of me and Steve Pemberton from the show Psychoville, which was one of my favourite jobs and my favourite shows. Mm-hmm. And I love Reese Shearsmith and Steve Pemberton as creators. And that's in my downstairs loo <laughs> uh, next to the Kappa border of Ridley Road. Oh, there you go. That's a good place for them, I think. I mean, not not that you know, <laughs> not that the reason and Steve should be in the loo, but it's a good place to keep them if you want to. You know, that's where you keep your Oscars and your Emmy and, okay. and your Baftas. Yeah. That'd be fine. Thank you. Yeah. If I could give you the gift of time travel, Sarah, and you could visit any film set ever being made for either a scene, like one single scene that you would watch and eavesdrop on, or to be there for the whole set, where would you go? I think I'd go to the train station of Brief Encounter, mm. which was shot in 1945, still when the world, Second World War was going. And they had to find locations that weren't affected by the blackout because there were blackouts, obviously, to hide from German air, uh, air fire. And I just think about telling a love story, telling a romance at that time when the country was in this heightened state of panic i mean british war spirit obviously but but the the energy on that set must have been and it's such an internal an internal experience of this love yeah. that cannot be i, I think that is, would... i don't know i can't remember where it is it's somewhere in, in um station. i think there was it was lancashire and some london in, interiors but I think there's a train station in Lancashire I think which has a plaque which yeah, I'd love I think to go it's to. still there yeah I think people do do visit it occasionally um well you'd be a marvellous Celia Johnson wouldn't you oh I'd love oh I mean <laughs> like yes I would die to play that you all right darling yes I'm all right I wish I could think of something to say it doesn't matter not saying anything, I mean. I'll miss my train and wait and see you in No, hours. please don't. I'll come over with you to your platform. I'd rather. Very well. Do you think we shall ever see each other again? I don't know. Not for years, anyway. The children will all be grown up. I wonder if they'll ever meet and know each other. Couldn't I write to you? Just once in a while. No, Alec, please, you know we promised. I do love you so very much. I love you with all my heart and soul. I want to die. Have you ever fallen in love at the movies? Well, um, the first date I had with my husband, my now husband, was we met by the Curzon Soho for a drink. We went to see Volver with Penelope Cruz Great that was film. the that was the first date movie and I I can't really re- I mean I'm terrible at remembering plots anyway it's always very sort of emotional my, my yes. memory of moments Me too. is it really yeah that's how I remember films how they make oh you my, feel I don't really oh my... remember what happened at all oh god because well, I was like well why can't I tell some people can literally list the beats of the plot and I just don't restore uh, like I don't retain it and, and and I feel like you're a film expert and you're saying you don't either and that reassures me 
Well, yeah, I hopefully, I, you know, I'm still working. So I, hopefully it works, but I really, really, I mean, it's very boring reading plot, to be honest. Right, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of always like slightly alarmed that I don't know what a plot is. But but I could tell you what it's saying or how it made me yes. feel, and but but especially didn't remember the plot of this one because I think I had a feeling that I'd met the man I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. It's really hard to watch a film when you're sort of slightly in love and t- tingling and yes. you're thinking, oh my god, I quite fancy this bloke. What's going on on the screen? Um, and yeah, you know, it's really impossible. It's like a you know complete blur, really. <laughs> yeah, and also <laughs> also <laughs> he's going to hate me saying this, but he had like three bathroom breaks because he like we'd we been in a pub and had been drinking pints <laughs> and I was like why does he keep popping out and then you know he has you know he has a small bladder which is an, which is an interesting <laughs> well he was probably like thing. oh my god I really fancy this girl that I'm with I no offense <laughs> he probably fancied Penelope Cruz as well because she's amazing and gorgeous and all that oh she's so she's there. such a goddess so yeah. he was like oh my god I can I even tell this girl I fancy her or I don't know how I'm going to do this and like how do you talk about Penelope Cruz when you're on a date with someone who's it was intense <laughs> it was an intense date and it was it was it was a great it was a great film it was such a great film and it was I, I remember the electricity of like watching it and being around him and he'd come he'd come from work and I'd come from the British Library and that's where it all started oh, and now you're married and now I'm married yeah. two children congratulations thank you very much see I know the movies do these things to people it's great these are great questions have you got a favorite screen musical moment it can be a dance number from like a musical but it yeah. can be the use of music like ex- exegetic without qu- without question is who will buy from Oliver. It, it is just the most exquisite piece of choreography. The market scene, I'm obsessed with markets. I, <laughs> I, I have more longing for the markets of Britain than I have for my own family. Uh, I miss... I miss Camden, I miss Covent Garden. Oh, you, you, miss... You've just written a piece that's called After a Market, really Road Market. Yes, I'm obsessed with markets. <laughs> so singing and dancing in markets with these incredible shots and this choreography and Oliver and the Awful Dodger weaving through is just incredible. And who will buy? They all come in because it's like, who's got the knives to grind and who do I my roses? Yeah. And they all come in. And all yeah, and of... they all come in. But well, also it's um, it's consider it's consider yourself and then who will buy it. They're sort of like two halves of the, yes. of the same feeling of, lo- of London and music and entering this new world yeah. and... And, and also selling your wares. And I found the original, again, on the Pathé Archives on YouTube is the original, like the milkmaids and the women, the flower sellers. And they would sing. And they would sing that song through the streets. And it's just, oh, it blows blows my mind. And and, and that film, that film does inspire, I mean, the, the Nancy's umpapa, the way she again, it's like the, it's the same of, of, of using joy and fun and music, but to get Oliver out of that situation and away from Bill Sykes, that choreography is just doing so many things, and it just, just delights me. What's your favourite cinema? You mentioned Curzon Soho as, as your date. That sounds pretty unbeatable. But have you got a favourite cinema that's in the world? I think the Curzon Soho, just because I've I've got had so many memories, and my friend Ryan Orman worked worked there for years and years at, at selling the tickets. So mm-hmm. I always I, so I had a really good friend there, and and the community of that of those cinemas, that independent cinema, and the, the events they had, and the, we were we I mean it was like a community place for us. Like we were we rehearsed plays in the foyer and and the and the it was a it was a very important part of my life as a space, um, the Curse and Soho. Oh that's lovely. And what about a film location? What's the famous film location? Either you've shot on, you've had the joy of filming quite a few. 
uh, or that you've seen in a film and just want to disappear into? You know, I've, I've filmed in, you know, Pinewood and Shepparton myself, and I've had some incredibly magic moments just both doing the work but also I remember a moment in I think it was Shepparton and I just finished Mrs Henderson Presents this film with this film with Judy Dench Bob Hoskins who's greatly missed um and and actually funded my first uh Edinburgh show with Olivia Poulet was Bob Hoskins wrote us a check yes that's how I started which and Mrs Henderson is, is shown every Christmas and every Christmas People text me going, I'm with my entire family watching you completely naked. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Um, but I but I just finished and I'd had to come back to pick something up or drop something off. And I passed Kate Blanchett dressed as Elizabeth in the hallway, in the corridor. And she had her side, you know, her little scene that she was about to do in her hands. She was looking and she looked at me and I looked at her and she gave me the smile and I and just... I, and I just walked by, and, and it's it, that feeling of uh, someone like her you, focusing, in, in, and it, you, she was dressed as Elizabeth the First, for God's sake, <laughs> and she was about to literally go on there, and she just broke it to give me that smile. And I keep that, um, I mean, slightly veering off your question about space, but 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 I keep that when I, you know, when I meet people or I'm uh, people come on to set the first time or see me in character I think what's it like for them that this is a huge moment I don't ever want to take it for granted just like Kate Blanchett offered me that important smile no, that's wonderful because filming at those places the ghosts of the, the right. characters and the ghosts of the actors who have played them mm. and the filmmakers have been there it, it's all there it's in the it's in the walls if you believe in psychodrography which yes. you seem to think you do it, 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 you have to imbue all that and know and know what you're doing. You know, you're in a, you're in a you know a craft and a profession that is kind of shaped by those previous people who've done it before you, and will come after you. Yes, exactly. It, you you can feel it. You can feel. I do believe you just you, you can feel in space uh, the the energies of things that have gone before. I know it sounds Californian woo woo, but that's who I am now, Jason. Yeah, you are. You've moved. You see, you've changed. Uh, changed. What, what do you watch? Do you watch some telly? Do you watch? What have you seen any telly? Have you seen any good films? Yes, I've seen well, um, White Lotus, oh, that's great, uh, isn't it? which is obviously what everyone's talking about, um, and I've watched I've watched that and really really enjoyed it, and um, uh, I've just finished shooting this show called Chivalry with Steve Coogan which is set in in Hollywood and is kind of in a um, similar vein of just holding a mirror up to to who we are and kind of the worst of us is that a um, tv yeah that's a tv show for channel four is that a baby cow yeah it's a baby yeah baby cow production I I was reassured because it felt like America's ready to hold a mirror up to itself and begin asking these questions about race and class and gender and being in Hawaii is is in, in interesting for yeah. a, a white, white Americans to go into this Polynesian island that is now part of America um, and I thought it was just incredibly clever because it's still very funny um, and, and very gripping and I think that was kind of what me and Steve Coogan was set out to do was not shy away from those themes but like how do you laugh along the way and uh see yourself maybe in all that hasn't to light well, he's just about to do jimmy savile isn't he so that's even yes harder. Um... yes it's always nice when your romantic lead co-star goes on to play a uh <laughs> horrific notorious pedophile <laughs> that haunt that haunts everyone yeah. that that's in the country <laughs> But, you know, he makes brave choices. What he can I does. say? That is, yeah, extraordinary. And what do you do? You, what do you watch when you want to just turn off? I'm. I watch like I watch um, kind of. I guess philosopher, like self helpy, uh, like Eckhart Tolle, Gabor Mate, Oprah Winfrey. I I'm a sucker for that kind of consciousness raising. Yeah, is that an uh, LA thing, or were you into that? Maybe, before? maybe I took ayahuasca and my life changed, and um, <laughs> and now I live on a spiritual dimension. But but uh, oh, I shouldn't and... have asked what you know what film changed your life. I said like, what what, what drug yes. changed your life? Yeah, <laughs> ayahuasca. I mean, it, it did. It totally did. And and so to rel- because because when you're especially when you're in it, that sometimes it doesn't you know, that you, the last thing you ever want to do is watch another sitcom or a drama, and 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 rarely they. They, you, know, you you don't see the tricks or the things that you do differently. That which is why something like White Lotus is so enjoyable because you just you just carried away with the story. But 
for total downtime, it's either like new age enlightened consciousness raising or uh, an episode of the Kardashians, which is also my happy place. And I've seen every episode and I'm not ashamed to admit that because it relaxes me. You go, girl. Have you ever read uh, Simon Amstel on his ayahuasca? Or he did a stand up, I think. On, on oh, his well, he's. Experience. Yes. I mean, he's a very good friend. He's godfather to my children and he's, you know, it was part of his, the profound experience it had for him that kind of, I would say inspired me, but like when I was called, as they say, you're called to it, you're called to the circle of the group of friends. It was him. I, I, I um, checked in with and said, what, sh- sh- you know, I'm going to do it. And he said, yes, well, the, and he gave me advice. He said, you have to surrender. You have to set the intentions. And he helped me through it. Cause it's a very intense experience. Yes. Yeah. Like, and he's still funny about it, is the is key. Yeah, he's still funny about it. Yeah, because it is fun. I mean, what comes up is you, you're you faced with your own pain and your own trauma. You relive it and then you sort of purge and you're sick. And it's if for people who don't know, it's this, it's this like Amazonian plant that is cooked into a tea that you drink with a shaman in a circle and then you'll probably vomit and feel a lot of physical pain and then hallucinate. So it's a fun night out. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do get some of those on a normal night out sometimes if it goes right. well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you see, that was me before I realised I had a drinking problem. <laughs> Sarah, it's been wonderful talking to you. Absolutely. And wonderful to see your work in Ridley Thank Road. You. I really was Thank very you. proud. I don't know, as a British Jew, to see it up there. Uh, and and to know that it was you, I was like, oh, go, you go, girl. This oh, Jason, thank you for everything you do. You're an incredible um, champion and a member of this community. And I'm so grateful that we had the time today to to, to connect. Thank you so much. Well, and you can watch the last episode of Ridley Road on BBC One on Sunday, October the 24th, and catch up with all of the previous three parts on BBC's iPlayer now. And that's it for this episode. Thanks to Sarah Soleimani for guesting and making such great choices, and to Kate Dawkins for putting it all together as usual. Let's go out then with a tune from Ridley Road going back to 1962 for a right old British classic pop song from Helen Shapiro. See you next time.